we must commit ourselves to the work that is necessary. If we desire to become salt and light for the world, make our time together a worshipful illumination, where we experience you and grow in our knowledge of what it means to follow your gift to the world, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel. Continuing on with the Sermon on the Mount, allowing that to help shape our thinking around the importance of education as people of faith, of recognizing the need to be in times to study and prayer if we're going to enrich our faith. I invite you to hear these words picking up with the 13th verse of chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, Jesus said. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. May our God richly bless these words of Scripture. find a Sunday school class, to find a small group, to find 
journey for Gracious God, we pray that your spirit, as it is moving among us this day, that it will speak to us, it will encourage us, it will help us to understand not only these words of scripture, but what it is that you wish for us this day. We pray this in the name of Christ. I was at a church event a few years back. It was a gathering of people that uh, well, didn't know each other well. And so like so often at a church event, there were a few icebreakers that we might get acquainted. The men were put on one side of the room, the women on the other, and we were each given a sheet of paper. Along the edge was the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, and all the way through C. And we were told that we were to fill in behind those letters a spice, a seasoning that started with those letters. Begin. I'm over with the guys. <laughs> Salt. Salt, yes. Salt. Pepper. Yes, somebody back there. You know exactly what these guys are about. Pepper. Pepper, yeah. Um, let's see, what next? Uh, uh, ginger, ginger, that's a good one. Uh, sea salt. Well, we already mentioned salt, and we've already got an S, so, you know, let's think of something else. Um, ground pepper. Well, that's still pepper. And uh, oregano, okay, well, that's a new one, that's a new one. Basil, that, that, that's a good one. Black pepper. Pepper again, we've already got a B, so... About that time, we had like five or six, the women say, done. <laughs> done. Now, it's important to note that they stretched just a little bit on a few of them, but by golly, they had A through Z. Us guys, you know, salt was where we started. We had the pepper, we didn't even know come up with the third of the triune of, of male cooking, which, uh, Salt, pepper, garlic. But we didn't come up with that one. And yet, it's, it's interesting to me how we started with salt. Because it really is kind of the go-to of American seasoning. I mean, it's what we think about. And yet, for many folks, they're told to reduce their salt intake or to completely get away from it. Yet when we think of it in terms of a seasoning, when Jesus spoke about it, he thought of it differently. It was an essential element of life. I mean, just think about it. It was what helped preserve food. Without it, the food would rot. It wouldn't be good. Salt was used to cleanse wounds when someone had an injury. And in a desert climate, where dehydration was an issue, salt, or the sodium in it, was essential. I mean, I don't know if you realize this, but long-distance runners often have an issue. They sweat out, including sweating out the sodium, the salt out of their body, and they drink plain water. It dilutes what remaining sodium is in their body. That is the most common cause of death among long-distance runners. I ran a half marathon a few years back, and about mile 9, mile 10, I saw a woman in front of me beginning to weave. She looked like she had a few too many drinks before the run. And then she kind of started leaning one direction, hit the curb, and went down the car. As I started to run to her, others gathered, including a, a medical team that was about 100 yards away. They were there caring for after the race, I saw her coming out of the medical tent. She had lost all her sodium. She was still kind of confused because of that experience. But it can be deadly. Well, desert shepherds, desert farmers, desert travelers had to be aware of that. 
the importance of taking in sodium, taking in the salt. And they didn't have medical teams a hundred yards away that would come to their rescue. And so when Jesus talks about salt in Scripture, this is not some meaningless, irrelevant term. It isn't some analogy that doesn't make sense to them. It, it means a lot. And so when Jesus goes on to speak about how salt loses its character, its value, that would have been shocking to people. I mean, I was trying to think of a way of describing this to a group of people, what it would mean to, to lose salt. And all I could think about was to say to them, imagine waking up and suddenly all your iPhones didn't work. There was this audible gasp in the room as people thought about that because their lives revolve around that screen. We think we can't live without it, but we can live without the iPhone. But you couldn't live without salt, without that that essential element of life. And so when Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, draws upon these essential elements of salt and light, people would have understood. But then Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are these essential elements. By saying that, these two short phrases are so loaded with ideas that, that they are like a manual for how one lives faithfully in the world. And that was important. In the days of Jesus, and later, 50 years or so down the road, at the time that Matthew's Gospel was written, these were people that were living under Roman occupation. They were living under a, a government that did not value, did not appreciate. They were surrounded by people that did not appreciate their faith. And so Jesus is giving them an insight, a tool into how one is to live when the culture does not accept what you believe is important. For most folks, at the time of Jesus and even later, they kind of did one of two things, or somewhere along the continuum. Their reaction was to run away from culture, to go out and live in the desert as far away as you could from the Romans. The problem was that in time, the Romans found you. Or was to go to the other extreme, and that was armed revolution against the Romans. And there were those that tried that. And though they had short-term successes, they were eventually squelched. One of the two, or somewhere along that continuum, was how people were responding to how to live in that situation. But Jesus offers a completely different model, an alternative with those two simple phrases. Be salt, salt of the earth, be, be light, light to the world. This is no longer going that direction or this direction on the continuum. It's going deeper. Because in the mind of Jesus, the culture, the Romans, were not some evil entity. They were people. They were people. And for Jesus, they, they needed these essential elements faith and life, just like anyone else. Salt and light. Brian Collier has written a book recently that I would recommend. It's called The Go to Church. Now it's important to put the emphasis in the right place. He isn't saying you need to go to church. I mean, yes, he didn't say that. But he's, he's saying the go to church. A church that is willing to go, to go into the world. He says that it's not about an attractional model, that we want to make sure that worship is perfect so people will come. No, it's a missional model where we are about the work of going out to the world. You've heard me say that 
it should not be about our seating capacity, but our sending capacity. It's not just about building numbers here, but about transforming lives and transforming the world out there. It is a shift in our thinking. The attractional model worked for about 20 years of Christian history, from 1945 to 1965. Since then, for approximately 50 years, we have tried to live out that attractional model. Build it and they will come. And for the last nearly 50 years, it has not worked at all, as Christianity has been in decline. And so we need to educate. We need to relearn what it means to be the salt of the earth, what it means to be light to the world. Jesus had to help his disciples to relearn what those phrases meant. To break away from that continuum of either running away from culture or attacking culture and offering an alternative. He taught them, he showed them, and then he sent them out to practice it. And what I love is in Matthew 17, it's as if the disciples, after going out and practicing, come back for an evaluation. They're sitting with Jesus, and they say to him, why did our practice fail? It didn't work the way we thought it was going to work. And Jesus says to them, you are to have the faith of a mustard seed. This tiny little mustard seed. But again, what people did is to think on a continuum. Oh, something tiny, something big. But that's not what Jesus was saying. He was inviting them to go again deeper. To think of it differently. The mustard seed, that's just an irritating weed. And among the Romans, who would often have a garden out behind their home, the worst thing that could happen is to get that little, tiny mustard seed in your garden. Because before you knew what happened, that little weed would take over your garden. Jesus is inviting them to be in the midst of the Roman people, to be in the midst of culture, midst of that world that may not value what you value, and to be like that mustard seed, and to grow and to begin to stretch and to, to bring in, to cover, to be salt and to be light in the midst of it. It was Benjamin Franklin who said, tell me and I will forget. Teach me and I might remember. Involve me and I will learn. I think that we have to, like the disciples, we need to practice what it means to be salt and light in the world. Because it's a whole different mindset. Instead of coming here and hoping others show up, we need to be out there being salt and light wherever people are. I'm guessing there's not one person here who couldn't name someone you meet every single week who's in the midst of brokenness and pain, somebody who is struggling with some issue, and you are to be salt. To be that little mustard seed that will grow unexpectedly in their life. About 14 years ago, I was in Cincinnati, Ohio for a meeting. And on Sunday morning, I wanted to go to the Vineyard Church there. Steve Sober is the pastor there. And Steve, years ago, started something called Servant Evangelism. It's this notion about going out into the community, going out into the world as servants to one another. And recognizing you don't go out just promoting your church. You go out because we call these servants. And he's growing his church around that. Being unintentional about bringing people in. People that wanted to be a part of that. Well, I walked into the church, into the lobby, there was a table set up that said, Servant Evangelism above it. I walked over to the table, and I said to the guy standing there, tell me about this servant evangelism. And instead of him telling me or handing me a pamphlet, he pointed.
points to the table where there are three sheets of paper, and he says, can you be here, or here, or here? There were three opportunities for servant evangelism out in the community. He knew he couldn't really tell it to me. I needed to practice it. And he was inviting me to practice it. I would say, no, 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 I just need some information. No. Meet me here, or here, or here. When I told him I was just a visitor, he began to talk about how he thinks we have forgotten the essential character of being a servant in the world. And I think that connects to this notion of being salt and light, being the essential gifts, the essential elements of life out in the world, among the people, being like that mustard seed that almost goes overlooked, and suddenly it begins to grow and expand and touch more and more and more. We need to go beyond the attraction model. What we do here at Cypress Creek is marvelous, but we also need to be out and about. What we do with boys and girls country, that's exactly that notion of being salt and light among people. Our prison ministry. We're not expecting them to come to church the following Sunday. Of course not. But it's about going to them in the midst of their situation and being salt and light to those individuals. Our Christian education, we need to think of it as a time of study and reflection and prayer and then a time to go and practice but we need mentors, we need people who take us by the hand and walk us out there to show us how to be salt and light to our sisters and brothers because it's a whole different mindset of what it means to be a community of faith. That at the end of the day, it's not about this building, not about this God gathering. It is about, it's about changing lives and changing Back in 1995, Linda Schaefer went to Calcutta, India, planning to take photographs of Mother Teresa. She wanted to create a book. She was a photojournalist. She wanted to create a book of images of Mother Teresa. She showed up unannounced, met Mother Teresa, told her her idea, and Mother Teresa said, no. And then said to her, come with me. And Mother Teresa took her to an orphanage and then took her to a hospice center at a leper community and invited her to begin volunteering. And she did. And later, later she wrote a book entitled Come and See a photojournalist's journey into the world of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa understood that you've got to go and practice. Mother Teresa couldn't just tell her. Mother Teresa couldn't just I'll have some pictures taken and that would help. No, she needed to go practice it to understand it. We need to go and practice what it means to be salt and light to the world. We need people who will teach us and mentors. We need to go out and practice it. And just like the disciples, we may come back and say, I feel miserable. And that's okay. We'll find a community here that will support us and encourage us and send us back out to practice again. We need to be the people out in the world, out among others, and showing to them these essential elements the gifts of God of love and mercy and kindness, sharing them in tangible ways. Because that is what's going to change lives. That's what's going to change the world. You pray with me. We pause to listen. To discern. To make ourselves available to you. You are calling us to be the life-giving sustenance to the world, to be salt and light. Gracious 
God, there are so many who may never find their way to the doors of this building. They may never find their way to the doors of any faith community, and yet you have invited us to be salt and light out there amidst those who desperately need you. Teach us, God. Provide for us mentors, those who will take us by the hand and, and help us practice. Gracious God, there are others, others connected to our faith community who are needing your grace, your love. This day we lift before you the family of Bobby Epperson and the family of Curtis Richmond. Both Bobby and Curtis have gone home to you. And yet in their deaths, there are those who are grieving and hurting. And we pray, O oh God, that we will be as a faith community, salt and light to one another, providing the gifts of grace that are needed. We also lift before you Linda Brady, who is preparing for surgery. We lift up Ruth and Bob and Bill and others in our congregation who are in the process of healing. And just a week from now, God, we will play host to IHU, to those who are transitioning out of homelessness. God, we pray that this community of faith will be hospitable and will help these individuals as we touch them with salt and light, grace and goodness. O oh Lord God, continue to work among us empower us, and then whisper to us to go and to practice. We offer these words in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples and in doing so taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our day.
Savior in suffering and death and resurrection, and most importantly, his commissioning after his resurrection to those who were left behind or with those specific instructions to go forth and share the gospel. So that is, that is really what we should remember as we, as we come to this table. The, the Apostle Paul told us that the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. We do this to remember. And he, in the same manner, he took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. Confirm in my blood. Do this to remember. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you will be announcing the Lord's presence until he comes again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. Each time we come to this table, it's such an honor and a privilege to take this cup and, and this loaf in remembrance of our Lord Jesus. And Lord, you know that each time I take this cup, I pray, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and a renew my spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Lord, help us to be the salt and the light, to show the world your love through us. Help us, Lord, to do that. And whether they come here or whether they come anywhere, they know about your love. Help us, Lord, and forgive us when we fail you, and help us to keep on trying. Here is Dr. Street. Uh, this table is the Lord's table and it's open to all believers in Jesus Christ. And we invite all who wish to uh, participate in the service of communion. Uh, the way we do communion here is as you come forward, you will take a piece of bread.
We came and honored you and remembered you with the loaf and the cup. And now we bring our blessings, our tithes, our offerings to you. Please bless them and show us a way that would be used to honor you. Be with us as we go through the following weeks. Help us to remember to be the salt.
Gracious God, you are the one that invited us into this time. You are the one that has graced us with your love. But we know, God, that our mission, our calling, is far beyond these ones. Back into our lives and into our daily living, and we pray, God, that wherever we might be, the people we might encounter, that we might be salt, that we might be light, that we might be those essential gifts of you. Now bless us in that great endeavor, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.